welcome to the Provoke and Inspire podcast, learning how to follow Jesus in a post-Christian culture. My name is Ben Pierce. I'm the host of the show. And joining me as always are David Pierce, Chad Johnson, Hello, everybody. Luke Greenwood, and Yo. Gary. See, now, it wasn't Gary. Chad, that was going to be our yes. explanation of where you are today. For those, oh, nice. But then if you my, came. Uh, you came. Uh, so. For those only listening that was the backup plan. and not watching, this yeah. is Gary. This is the, the skeleton that would have been Chad had Chad not shown his up. Smile, his smile looks very similar. Yeah, this kind of looks does. like you. Again, we're, we're doing looks very like bad Chad. radio his forehead, here. His forehead yeah. also looks yeah, like His I forehead like, and smile. Chad, Even his what? eyes are, are reflective of mine. Luke, when you say big, we will not explain black. this. Yeah, we will not explain this to listeners. It will be a temptation for them to find this video yeah. somewhere. Yeah. Yes, you know how we like to tempt. Uh, the Provoke and Inspire podcast is an official Steiger International podcast. Steiger is a worldwide mission organization that mobilizes followers of Jesus to reach young people who would not walk into a church. For more information, resources, and how to get involved, go to David Steiger dot o r g s t e i g e r dot o r g it's a good thing i did that because prior to that david was completely disengaged because as we all know he has no <laughs> tolerance for the shenanigans of others if other people are yes. going on you know sort of rants and and, and making weird well, jokes he just about, disconnects i was thinking our listeners don't understand because you're holding that skull up uh <clears throat> to the camera Yes. And it reminded me, I don't know if you guys heard of this really You old... don't get a pre-random no, story, I, I, no, random story. this is story. important. If you guys have heard of the Dennis the Menace, I don't know if you've ever heard yeah, of that. Oh, the, yeah, the yeah, yeah. I used to read that. 80s. All right, so I saw this one cartoon one time, and Wilson was like some guy in Dennis. <sighs> Wilson, I don't know who Wilson was, but... And then there was this one cartoon where it had Dennis the Menace. He was holding his skull, and he said, Look what I found in, De in Wilson's head. <laughs> wow. All right, moving on. Uh, the anyway, I don't know. It just made me think of that. It was nostalgic. Hey, I, I spoke at a church this weekend, and I told a bunch of people to listen. And so there's always a different pressure when I know a bunch of people will listen. And then they're like, what is this? So first of all, if yeah. you're here uh, from Real Life Sacramento, thank you. And I apologize for the beginning. If you made it this far, I appreciate you. Just so you get a sense for what's coming. Uh, we have a show that has a pattern to it. It starts always with David's random story. Sometimes it starts with a pre-random random story, uh, as it did today. So I apologize for that. Uh, but David's random story is a perilous journey into the wacky world of David's life and mind. Uh, then we have Steiger News Flash. Uh, as I said, this podcast is part of a missions organization show a missions organization called Steiger. Uh, and every week we hear an exciting testimony of how God is moving through this mission around the world. Uh, you'll be very much encouraged by that. Uh, then we have Punching Through the Awkward. Uh, it's a week-by-week -week look into Chad's attempt to take Holy Spirit-inspired risks. Uh, it's the successes, the failures. This week is awkward. Yes, that's good. And expensive. I told, I told people... <laughs> I have no idea where we're going to go. I'm excited. It's mysterious. Uh, I told people that every good thing is on the other side of awkward, so we'll put that to the test. Uh, so we're going to check that out. And then finally, our main topic is a pretty rough one. It's uh, very sobering. It's the tragic death of Masa Amini uh, in Iran and the uh, riots that happened afterwards. Uh, I know it's been a few weeks now, and uh, in the news, people are already kind of moving on, but this is still very much happening in Iran, the reaction to uh, her death because of the way she was wearing her hijab. Uh, so we're going to be talking about that. Um, and, and, and not only, obviously, the tragedy that, that was her death, but also um, the secular view of it and, and their rage about it and kind of how even that conversation can be a powerful way to talk about Jesus. So you're going to want to stick around for that. Uh, I promise you're going to be encouraged by that challenged by that and you'll be able to use that in your regular life so that's what's coming up today uh so let's get going david's random story whoop, whoop. so anyway uh in the early days when when i was in amsterdam i lived in amsterdam and uh we were doing a lot of stuff <laughs> in the, punk, <laughs> the, in punk the early scene. days when amsterdam, i lived in amsterdam, I lived in amsterdam. <laughs> and uh, uh so we did a lot of stuff in the punk scene and whatever and i always had a vision because in the punk scene, rats were important, and I always had a, uh, I had a vision for releasing the rats. Uh, so it'd be like, 
because rats, yeah. Yeah, so you know, you'd be at a sh- because you, I, I, you could buy. I don't know what it is like now, uh, but this was during the time of the of the gilder, or they, as they say in Dutch, the gilden. It was not the euro; it was the why, gilder, why, and you that could is buy. So provincial. Why? Why are you, you could buy? About I'm trying. To, I'm trying to put color around the story. So you hey, could we had buy. a we had a Dutch guy. No we one had a asked Dutch for guy mustard Furnace yellow. Fest, okay. By the way. So anyway, so you could buy. You could buy like a rat for like. Like a gilder and a half, two gilders. Rats were quite cheap back then. Um, Inflation now, of rats has just skyrocketed. <laughs> yeah, now they're like, so now they're like can, four gilders. No, <laughs> no, like I think rats now gilders. are like like ten 20, euros, twenty eight gilder. gilders. Nobody cares um, how yeah. much rats are. <laughs> but see, at the time, rats were quite inexpensive, and I was thinking, wouldn't it be awesome at a show to have like a whole. <laughs> like box full of rats a duffel you know bag. so you could you could <laughs> just buy. release the rats yeah yeah so you could buy release. you could buy like you could buy like for 50 50 you know we euros. understand the math <laughs> one dollar so could... two dollars we get it lots of so rats. you get Bo- so you get like <laughs> so i always was going to do this like hey do you know because we we're playing all these crazy punk clubs and they and so we thought i'm gonna have a part in the show and i'm gonna go Release the rats, and then we'd open the the rats, and they'd run through the club, <laughs> and that was a plan. But then, just when I was gonna mm-hmm. go to buy all the 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 rats, then I got a, the this, Someone looked into it and said that you could get in big trouble because apparently, in Holland, they have a whole society uh, there to preserve the dignity Rat-free. and the well being of rats. Did you yes. guys know that it's like it's a called rat- a Rita. Yeah. Yeah. Part, like, I'm actually part of that. Society. No, but I'm glad that I've learned that today. Pro, pro yeah, rat. because yeah, they actually have a rat groomer, if you will. The Narcy, so they, yeah. yeah, and then they have like a special. You can get if you go to a, a pet store, they have special organic rat food, and they wow. and uh, and it's, they yeah. also. We, they what? preserve the well-being of the rats. That's good. Let's keep they going. Preserve the- well, well, also, David, wouldn't there be a problem? Wouldn't it be like similar to releasing possums in New Zealand, like to release rats in Amsterdam? Like no, you, because in New Zealand, they, increasing the population. In New Zealand, they hate possums. In fact, they try to run over them all the time. Right. I know. That's why I'm comparing it to rats <laughs> in the city. In, no, in, 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 in uh, actually, in Amsterdam, they love rats. I had a, We were coming back one time late from a club, and there's this like, giant rats <laughs> on the street. And my guitarist uh-huh. started running, chasing after the. He goes, "Can you finish rat. a he sentence?" Starts, he it's starts hard to running edit at. This. He, sta- he starts running to the towards the rat, and the rat. I'm not kidding. This is true. Turned around and started chasing him. <laughs> so, <it> was, <laughs> are you sure it was a rat, or was it a uh, Indonesian water rat, or water, whatever? What was it? Well, yeah, well maybe it was from rat. Indonesia. I'm not no, because they have a lot of great restaurants there. So anyway, the whole my whole idea of releasing the rats never happened. Um, maybe in the future, but I feel like things are moving further and further towards the, the, we need to be kind of rats movement. So I don't think Mm. it's ever going to happen. And that's the random story for the day. Well, at the very least it was new. I mean, was it good? It was entertaining, but it was new. I think it's, it is good to have that idea on the shelf for a moment where I think there will come a time, you know, if, if the world just keeps you know, going the direction it's going, there'll come a time where people won't mind if you release rats. So I don't think so, Luke. I don't see it going backwards. I think it's even getting worse. I mean, you know, yeah, we're, the day of the, the rat rats, is in the rear. The rats <laughs> like to be released. Also, let's be honest. Yeah. So it's yeah. like, why is that a problem? I mean, if would you want rat, to be a rat in a duffel bag, just at a punk show, just <laughs> eagerly awaiting being released? And then I just, yes. I try to understand the motivation. Like, what is the crowd supposed to do in that moment? Because my my gut is that they would probably flee. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, it'd be very entertaining. I, it is a good idea if you were in a concert and yeah. suddenly like a, a mass of rats ran through the crowd. That yes. would be pretty entertaining. It yeah, would be no, pretty, probably be, it'd probably give, be newsworthy. I would say you should would, change your yeah. strategy slightly and release the rats from the back because then they would rush the stage and then <laughs> right, you'd have to you'd have true. to bar the doors and windows of course. <clears throat> All right, moving on. That's that's really great. This is a Steiger news flash. Huzzah! All right. Well, I thought I'd find a story that in some ways and this is serious. This is I think it's cool. It relates in some ways to the topic. <laughs> That we're talking about today. Oh, sorry. No, they talk about rats. <laughs> no, not that topic. 
the topic that we got. All right, in let's the start East. again. Three, two, one. Right. This is a Steiger News Flash. Anyway, I thought I'd move move away. <laughs> I thought I'd move away now from the rat topic, and uh, and go a bit closer to where we want to head, which at least goes to the same region of the world. But we, I don't know if the list, our listeners know this, but we have a team, a Steiger team in Beirut, Lebanon, which I always think is amazing, and actually has been going on for years now. We've been going to the Middle East and doing stuff there for how long, David? Ten, twelve years. Man, I think the first uh, time was two thousand. It's been a long time. Seven or eight. We first went to Beirut. Yeah. I think when was that, Ben? The first time. I don't. It was I don't like, know what? if I was I even the one that went first. Right. I I don't remember. It's been a long time. Yeah. It's been long a while. Time. We've been there yes. a long time. Yeah. Ten plus years. Let's go so, with that. And I think ever since we've been going there, one thing that's been really interesting and clear is that the same demographic of people that we reach in Europe, in the Americas, everywhere is in the Middle East. So this um, demographic of people who are growing up questioning institution, questioning the tradition and the religion of their parents and, and thinking in a different way, being more influenced by a global culture than anything else is so real there. And Beirut's a great example of it. So we've always seen that, um, you know, tragically, there's so much has changed in that city over, over this past decade and so many troubles there. But the young universities... The creativity, the just the just the global culture in that city is really amazing. So we've had a team there for a while, and they're doing great work. We it's in, increasingly been a team of Lebanese. You know, we started off with internationals coming in, and it's just grown now. There's a lot of young Lebanese involved, and they they do crazy stuff. They go out um, doing creative street evangelism. They have two Bible studies for skeptics. Um, and they're going into uh, like open mics and clubs and places. Uh, and they've been doing a lot in the clubbing area of downtown Beirut. Chad, you went with us there once, yeah. I remember. Um, and so they, they have this really cool clubbing area in downtown Beirut. And the, the team go there uh, regularly and they sometimes do street staff street performances and 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 draw a crowd. Um, sometimes they're just going and talking to people and, and building relationships. And for a while now, they've been working on opening their own cafe. And this week, they are opening the cafe. Um, it's called The Living Room, Beirut. Uh, and you can check it out on Instagram, um, Living Room, Beirut Cafe. And it's awesome because it's a place for community in that. They're, in, they're right in the clubbing district on that same street. They've so been great. doing the work. It's right there. It's a cool, big open space, and it'll just be a place for them to invite and engage people. Now, you know, especially if you're in the U.S. context, that's that could sound cliche. Oh, yeah, church opens a cafe. This is not what you're thinking. It's not like another church-like place for Christians to go hang out. This is very much in a secular scene. Um, it's non-Christians there. Their Bible studies are mostly people that go to their Bible studies are atheists or Muslim background um, or Muslim background atheists or, you know, of all, all kinds of different. And, and it's just really cool to see what they're doing and building a place for community uh, in that environment is, is a great next step because they're having conversations every week with people and now they have a place to invite them back to. So you, sh you guys should check it out and yeah. be praying for the team yeah. in Beirut. Yeah, it, it does relate to our main topic. And I think it is some somewhat hard to picture what a place like Beirut, Lebanon is even like. I think even I had a lot of stereotypes before going. Um, and yet it's amazing to, to see the effect of globalism and the entertainment industry and social media and the idea that, or the fact that they're just like anywhere in the West. I mean, listening to the same music, watching the same movies, influenced by the same desire uh, to be sort of emancipated from the religion of their parents. You have a lot of this secular humanism influence there. Um, and, you know, Beirut is often described as kind of the Middle East, or sorry, the, the Las Vegas of the Middle East, uh, in the sense that a lot of, you know, uh, Gulf Arabs and, and Muslims from throughout the Muslim world will come there to kind of be more free to express themselves the way that they maybe can't back at home. And so being there is extraordinarily strategic, uh, and uh, it's awesome. So be praying for them. Uh, be pray that it God, yeah. Go ahead. Well, I was just going to say it is very in influential in the in the Gulf states because, it, you know, you guys have been there and you would see these these guys from Saudi Arabia driving these these uh, 
Maseratis and Porsches and stuff like that. <laughs> it's just yeah. crazy. Mm-hmm. You would think in Be- with all the insanity of Beirut, but yeah. they go there to party yeah. and to, yeah. and and uh, I don't as far, I don't know what the situation is uh, for sure, but I probably this is the only thing like that in Beirut. That'd be my guess. Mm. You know, yeah. this kind yeah, of yeah. space where people can yeah. come and and know that they're going to be able to talk about deep issues like this. Yeah. And so it's it's huge. We fought for this for a long time to have it's to true. see this happen. Yeah. And it's so true. it's very, and I think very the, exciting. The, and the recent reality in Beirut has made the work they do just all the more important and relevant because if you guys follow, you know, if our listeners, you know, you follow the news, it's just been terrible economic crisis, like one of the worst in in world history and just the polit- whole political system totally broken and and um and so people so many people leaving a lot of the young people uh, lebanese young people have left um and that's particularly tough for the team and the guys that they reach a lot of people when i was over there uh earlier this year they w- they were just saying you know that sometimes it feels like just really lonely like a lot of their friends and people have left you know moved away um so everything we talk about, the loneliness, the anxiety, yeah. the uh, trying to figure life out, that's so true and real there. And young people are so keen to, you know, to find something more. Yeah. And, and there's a real fight. There's a real desire for change there. So. Yeah, we've been, we've been promoting uh, the Steiger Intensive, online intensive that's happening November 18th and 19th at the beginning of the podcast for a while you know, maybe God would call you to be part of this Lebanon team in some way, maybe physically go, certainly support, maybe give. Uh, In any event, uh, if you're feeling God's call on your life and you're wondering what to do next, uh, the Steiger Intensive might be the best way to to take that first step. It is online, um, so it's not hard to be there in that sense. Uh, If you go to steiger.org, O-R-G, as David always says, slash intensive, uh, you can find out more information and you can register. It is free to register, but you do need to get your spot. You need to claim it. Um, and this might be your first step towards being called to go to Beirut, Lebanon and, and support that team uh, as they do very hard, very crucial work in that region. So uh, moving on to our main topic, uh, it is a really heavy topic. I'm sure you're aware uh, there was a 22-year-old um, young girl, Masa Amini, um, from the Kurdistan region of Iran, uh, she died in custody after she was detained uh, last month by the morality police in Iran, which is a, a strange thought. Um, she she was pulled over in her car, and allegedly she didn't have her hair fully covered um, with her hijab. So it's not like she wasn't, you know, wearing some crazy outfit or defying their rules in some way. I mean, she was even wearing her hijab, just not covering her hair completely. Um, three days later, you know, she was taken into custody, and three days later she died. Um, she was you know, beaten essentially to death, um, and, and there's been a, a just an eruption of protests. Iranian women, especially, have been incredibly courageous, um, and they've been burning their headscarves in, in in the streets, waving them around, um, risking their lives. Schoolgirls have joined this anti-government protest again, removing their headscarves and chanting slogans against the Islamic Republic. Um, outside of Iran, of course, people have joined in solidarity with what. They're doing even the, the the men's soccer team, which I thought was really cool, um, kind of showed their support for for Amini and what had happened. Um, Forty one people so far, and th- this is this is old news. I mean, this is happening despite Iran's attempt to suppress it. Um, this is still going on. Protests are still happening. People are still dying. Forty one people, according to Iranian state TV, but I'm sure it's much much more than that, including those that have been thrown in jail, probably never to be seen again, and. You know, it's it's this really, really brutal situation that I think um, we're obviously in the West reacting to, you know, like I said, for obvious reasons, um, but it's really hard to put our minds in that place. Um, but it's been something for those that know this region and who have studied this region, it's been something that's really been building up. Um, there was, a, of course, a revolution in Iran in 1979, uh, and that's where things really started to become um, you know, a th- it, that's where it really became a theocracy, where, you know, the highest power there um, was this Ayatollah, you know, who, who was really bringing these sort of, you know, in, in enforcing these Muslim rules from the top down. And, and it started a little bit more relaxed, and it's slowly become more and more intense, more and more restrictive, 
Women, of course, especially have lost more and more of their rights. They can't work in the same building as men. They can't go to class or in public settings with men. They can't ride bikes. They can't dance. You know, they, they have to wear, of course, their job. Um, and, and so it's it's been this this frustration building up because, Luke, as you said, the young people there especially have the Internet. They, they see what's happening around the world. They see the freedom that's in the rest of the world, the good parts of it and the bad parts of it. And they don't want to live under this sort of autocratic dictatorship theocracy anymore. Uh, and so there's this incredible outpouring of, of courage. You know, it's one thing to do a little hashtag in, in the U.S. or Europe, but these women and schoolgirls and men are risking their lives to stand up to this government. And these, you know, the Iranians are very sophisticated, highly educated. Yes, of course. It's not it's not like a backward society, you know, where they're living out in, in kind of a no, but again, you know, undeveloped. That... They're extremely sophisticated before the whole Ayatollah took over. They're very Western in the way that they they lived. And, and so this is really crazy. Right. You know, and I happened. think that's part of this. That's actually part of this conversation, because similar to my misconceptions about Beirut, I think a lot of people have misconceptions about the Middle East in general you know, that it, that it's very disconnected and unsophisticated. And of course, it's completely erroneous. So it, like we always start, I want to just get 60 seconds from each of you. David already used 20 of his 60 seconds. <laughs> but let's just react to this um, and and kind of dig into to what happened um, from the various angles and then and then look at some of the 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 important discussion points that we should hit so that all of us who are listening, all followers of Jesus can know how they should react and what they can do. So, Luke, how about you kick us off with 60 seconds? Uh, for me, what's hit the most, what's just extraordinary is is the courage they, that they're showing right now. It's just That's just hit me big time as I've kind of followed uh, media on it. Is It's like knowing just a little bit, just understanding a little bit of what the oppression is like there and the violence um, towards people that would yeah. protest and, and women and everything, just seeing... Even like teenagers and school kids going out and and when they protest, there's so much life and power to it. Like they're so strong. Like when you hear the like the chants on the streets and stuff, they're just it's not it's not at all kind of you know uh, hidden or careful protests. They're very vocal and very just so. There's obviously a lot of anger and um, but incredible courage and it's just. Uh, well, like you guys are already saying, I think for me, it just reminded me of where society's at there, at how how it's hard for us, I think, to understand how there can be a country which is, I think the the thing is, it's this, uh, there's only two theocracies in the world, Iran is one of them, and so to have a government that's run, you know, as an autocratic system with the religion being at the center of it, but then having these young people, these university students who think so differently and are willing to go out and protest in that way um, is is really, yeah, it's crazy. So, And I think it does raise a lot of questions for us. It raises a lot of questions uh, for us to understand um, the power of worldview and culture and, and, and how, what is it people, what, what, like a big question for me is like, why? Why do they see it so differently? What ha- Obviously, when somebody dies like that, like uh, Massa did, um, people get angry. But this is beyond that. Like, she's become an icon of that. And it's like, wow, where is that coming from? Where is this hunger for that kind of justice and freedom and equal rights and all of that? That just is huge for me. What do you think, Chad? Yeah, I was going to say that's uh, I I feel similarly. um, I think one of the things that really stood out to me is that what's so unique about what about the expression of revolt and uprising that's happening well one it's primarily driven by women and by uh voices that in and of itself like just the fact that they are speaking out so publicly and so aggressively is like a a huge shock like to to put it into context I, i was trying to find the opposite side, like the like the the Muslim perspective for why the hijab matters and the value in it, and like how a, a more fundamental kind of is, Islamic perspective would be. And, and essentially, I found this quote: this this Muslim cleric 
here in the U.S. He, he likened the protest in Iran to protesting for the right to walk around naked in Texas. And, and I just thought, you know, that's like, that might be how the opposite side of this sees it. Like the, like the, the removing of the head covering and the burning of it, it is uh, essentially from, from their perspective, uh, a public indecency and, uh, and even deeper. And so the fact that this is happening, not, in country or, or, or cities like New York or Los Angeles or Minneapolis or London, but th this is happening in, in every major city throughout Iran. That like that to me is what is so like the, the level of personal risk that people are, are taking in this case uh, is, is un obviously unprecedented. Yeah. My thoughts are um, revolution only comes when you're willing to die that that it's it doesn't happen any other way and that you know makes me think of how jesus said if you lose your life you will save it and i feel like there needs to be a whole nother level of understanding about you know we can look at not just the things that are going on in iran but in many other places including uh the u.s or wherever uk but until we come to the level of commitment like like they're like like they have there where they're actually willing to lose their life for what's just and what's right uh, i don't think we're going to see any any big changes and also i think religion is violence i think it's a it's a true religion is violent and and fascist and uh and that's why people need to understand that jesus being a jesus follower is the opposite of that yeah i i think luke you touched on something that i think we should spend a lot of our time in which is that people are willing to literally die in Iran to defend something that they feel is so important. You know, they, they could live physically safe if they would just conform to the rules, right, for the most part. But instead, they're saying, no, this isn't living. And if this is what living is, I don't want it. And I'd be real, willing to risk my life to fight for something better, Th this sort of just deep visceral intuition that I should be free and and that I have value and that that I should not be controlled or suppressed and of course this resonates with the West obviously um, but it also should resonate with followers of Jesus and what I want to talk about is how do we have a better conversation about why that's in all of us where that comes from and how to how to get there how to fight for that without of course making this into some sort of callous talking point because people are really risking their lives and and not only in iran but in other places around the world and throughout history right we have fought for this thing called freedom and and you know value of each person and autonomy we've been fighting for that forever that just seems to be this irrepressible human need that you can you know you can like contain it autocratically for a while but people rise up right they won't be suppressed forever they, they, they will like, it's like they, 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 that's not how they were designed to live. Uh, and so I want to look at that um, as a main topic. Um, well, that just, sorry, just a quick comment on that, Ben, is just like that. W the last thing you just said, that's, that's, I think, ma one of the main reasons why this is happening. It doesn't work to, 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 through an autocratic rule and through enforcing rules to, to try to, make a society be in a particular way that that's like because earlier on you in what you were just saying you were like you said something about that if they were to just go along with the rules they'd live a, a you know semi-safe life but the the reality is it's it just doesn't work that way that's the thing they are under sure that's what some of the voices we've been hearing is that they're under an oppression that us in the west don't don't really get and and so that's a big part of you know they're they're just there's something in our nature, which I know this is what you were saying as well, Ben, but there's something in our nature that just does not fit with that kind of oppressive control. Like, it just doesn't work. You can't keep it like that for a long time. And on the other hand, we've discovered through other experiments of, of government and of society that there's another whole side of the spectrum that doesn't work either. And so for me, one of the biggest points in all of this is it really matters what you believe and yeah. what what is at the core of how we live our lives and how life is 
is directed. And, and so it re to me, it really questions one of the big lies I think that's in secular culture, which is it doesn't matter. It really matters right. what you believe and how things are done and how rules are set. Right. And, and we should just stay here because I think this is the most important thing because this irrepressible desire to be free is a reflection of how we were created, right? You can't treat us like animals. Like you can treat us like animals, but we will rise up. Like there is something in us that will say this is not okay. Uh, and it can happen for a time, but it tends to, like you said, lead to this rebellion against a, a sort of fundamental uh, distortion of how we were created. And, and so there's this commonality of belief that what's happening there is wrong, of course, by the people that are experiencing the oppression, but also throughout the world. Um, but I think what you were saying, Luke, that's so important is that we have to have the right foundation because I think what you see in the West is this, this cry for freedom and autonomy, but it's, it's built on secular humanism, which doesn't give you that. Um, I, I think of, um, you know, well, let me, let me play this clip because I think it's a really crucial clip. Uh, and then I think we should continue to talk about this. There's a, an artist who I really think is, I really respect in a lot of ways. His name is Young Blood. Well, it's not his name, but that is, that's his stage name, Young Blood, uh, from the UK, um, passionate evangelist for secular humanism and, and really cares. I think he's kind of a, a young Zach De La Rocha, like from Raging Against the Machine. That's what he reminds me of. Someone who's just angry, legitimately angry about injustice, but is so clearly confused about the, the right uh, foundation for it. You can even hear it in this tiny, angry little speech. So let me, uh, this is him at a concert talking about what happened in Iran. Uh, let me just pull it up here. It'll be a little clunky, but it'll be worth it. Uh, so just give me one second. Let's listen to this. Here we go. I'm so angry right now. And every time something in the world happens like this, I ask myself if I'm gonna fucking talk about it or not. But well, there are thousands of you out there, and there are thousands watching at home. So today I have no f***ing choice. Last week in the country of Iran, a young girl called Masai Mini was murdered for wearing her hair outside of her hijab. And I am not going to stand here and question someone's religion. But I am gonna f***ing fight for expression! I am gonna fight for freedom! And I am gonna fight for the women of f***ing Iran right now! The right to express yourself is your right and your right alone! And since last week, in the country of Iran, the internet has been disabled in some places, meaning they cannot communicate with the rest of the f***ing world. So it is up to us to talk for them. It is up to us to speak. So, there it is. Um, well, just let's just react to that, because I think a lot of what he said communicates... A lot of what he said communicates the incoherence of what we're describing. So how does that hit you guys to hear someone be so angry? And, and what, are, what about some of the words that he said? Well, I think he was, I think he's, a, like you said, Ben, he's an unsaved evangelist. He's like Saul before he became Paul, uh, you know, because Saul was extremely passionate. Uh, what, you know, and he would he would go so far as to hold the clothes of people when they were they were stoning heretics heretics to death. He was he was he was extremely intense about everything. And then when he had this revelation of Jesus, then he knew why why he was so emotional, why he felt things so emotionally. And uh, I think that's how when you're close to Jesus, that's how you are. You're intense about things. Jesus was not stoic. He didn't just. Uh, he didn't see the um, the suffering and the injustice and not emotionally enter into the pain of that. And so I think uh, that's what it makes me think is that on one level, that's we need to be more that way as Jesus followers. We need to be more intense, intensely concerned uh, and a little less uh, just academic about 
the needs that are going out there. I think that's why a lot of people look at Jesus followers today and go, they don't care about injustice. They don't care sure. about suffering, you know, because we're just so Pollyannic about it. So we're not willing to enter into the, into the, the pain of it. The, uh, the, you know, and, and, and I, you know, I've talked about this in other settings, but Jesus was also angry, you know, and I think there's a place for anger. And I think that we've lost, sure. uh, there needs to be more in the in godly, and I'm not, t- you know, I'm talking about, about injustice that people are going through, you know, the, like what's happening here in Iran. And, and so I think in, a, in the right way, we should be leading the way in this kind of a thing. And I think it would help a guy like, like him go, Jesus is someone I should consider, you know, because he right. is passionate and he does care and he's not indifferent. Yeah. Yeah, there's a. There's a verse in the Quran that says, let there be no compulsion in religion. And I think what Youngblood and what so many people are getting at is that this, uh, the, top, the theme here really isn't about the hijab. It really isn't about a head covering. It's about the forced uh, compulsion or, or propelling people to act a certain way that that is opposite of what's actually in their hearts or or what's even what's not i don't think that even from my understanding that that uh people who are protesting throughout iran are saying we have a problem with with islam at the core i think that more than that they may but more than that it's it's a problem with the fact that there's a there are literally police who will hunt them down if their hair right, and- is you know and and i i i don't know if i'm enough of an expert to my my very limited understanding of it would seem to suggest that this is actually a natural extension of what islam looks like when it's lived out fully honestly when it's actually lived out to the letter and again you're right i don't think this necessarily is a conversation about the job it's about the enforced wearing of the job although i think we have to be very careful in in the comfy woke west to cavalierly say that the job's not a big deal i I think in iran it is an a symbol of oppression now maybe the actual wearing of it isn't a problem but the fact that it's being used to to control women makes it a symbol of oppression my my, the, the place where i think we need to land on in this conversation um is to challenge the outcry of the west to even make statements that it does because even in the very speech of youngblood he says I'm not here to challenge anybody's religion, dot, 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 and then goes on to challenge somebody's religion. And I think part of the challenge with this conversation is that the West has basically made a religion out of personal expression, personal freedom, but doesn't really have the foundation to do it. It, it feels that moral intuition that, like what we've said, that people matter, that that um, they, they have dignity and rights and should not be oppressed or suppressed and yet it's really stripped away any of the objective basis to do so because it's relativized everything. I think of the brilliant scholar Tom Holland, who we've had on this podcast, who, who really talks about the, how the West is indebted to Judeo-Christianity for its conceptions of individual worth and value and dignity. He writes this in his book Dominion, which I highly recommend. If secular humanism derives from—sorry— If secular humanism derives not from reason or from science, but from the distinctive course of Christianity's evolution, a course that, in the opinion of growing numbers in Europe and America, has left God dead, then how are its values anything more than the shadow of a corpse? What are the foundations of its moralities, if not a myth? So basically it's saying God is dead, we don't need him. And yet it's, it's stripped away the very foundation it requires to be so angry about people's personal rights being violated. Isn't that really the heartbeat of this conversation, Luke, that we, in a loving way, in the West, need to challenge people who are morally outraged on the one hand and have eroded moral foundations on the other? Yeah, it's a great opportunity to ask the question, Great, I agree with you. You're, with like you were saying, David. How I mean, we should be more on the forefront of being angry about injustice in the world. So we should be able to not only say we agree with you, but actually be at the cutting edge of that, and people to see that and say, "Oh wow, okay, we've got common ground here." But then to ask the question you're asking, Ben, which is, "Well, yeah, but what what ground is that? 
where you know what what basis do we have to say it's not okay to oppress somebody and what rules if we're not following the rules of islam what rules are we following and does secularism have a better alternative and i think the questioning the challenge that we're bringing is well i don't see it i don't see it because you you get very confused you know if you're going to defend one person's right when do you defend the other person's right and like you pointed out ben there's a confusion there of okay on one hand i have to hold tolerance so i have to say that islam is great and as valid as anything else and and on the other hand i have to protest against the oppression of the people in in iran and the wearing of the hijab and you know i was trying to think through the hijab thing cuz we actually talked about it a bit last week um when we were doing our prep together and i was saying i was saying oh i've heard um, you know, Muslim young women explain that the hijab is a is a positive thing for them, that they, they like, you know, it's part of their culture. And that's what you guys have pointed, you know, a lot of woke uh, people are saying that now, you know, oh, you have to respect it. And then, Ben, you sent a really interesting interview, which was the Michaela Peterson interview with a guy from Iran who lives in the US, so I'm pretty sure has a lot of that influence of that culture. But he's he's kind of saying, no, uh, you guys don't understand that the, the hijab is an oppression in Iran. And there's probably a difference, right? There's there's Muslims in Europe or in the US who will use the same arguments to say, we want to have our freedom to have our religion and wear a hijab where we want to. Fair enough. But, you know, it it is, I think the point you made is very, very valid, Ben. It's like, we have to think through where does our worldview, where does the way we see the yeah. world lead yeah. us? So if, if Islam is true, what does it look like when it's fully lived out? If secularism is true, what does it look like when it's fully lived out? And we can no, the, look, the big thing here is you can no longer say, doesn't matter what you believe. It really does. It makes drastic difference. And so we got to think through what it is and, and why. And that's the opportunity. That's the opportunity for conversation right now with people. And he's like, okay, so you think that way? Why? What? And 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 this really matters. It really matters. Let's figure this out. What's the right way? And we have to be really careful to not be cavalier about the power of ideas, because here here's the thing that's that's dangerous, right? If if all ideas are the same, if there's no basis for truth of any kind, then essentially what that does is it it displaces the truth to power and consensus. And, and not even really consensus, but mostly power. So in other words, if you can't point to something outside of human opinion to say, no, my value, my rights, my dignity cannot be violated by any government, by any oppression, by any system, whatever. If they are not grounded outside of us, like in God, in the Judeo-Christian God embodied in Jesus, then they can only re really be enforced by power, right? And so here we are in the West where we talk about tolerance and freedom of expression but do you guys think it'd be a big shock if we had a moral police in 20 years? Hmm. I mean, aren't you seeing that already? I mean, you think about hmm. the words you can and cannot say. You think about the opinions you mm -hmm. can or cannot have. You think about what you'll be canceled for if you don't fall in line with the moral majority on things. Do you think it's that big of a stretch? Well, we're, yeah, because like, we're even you know what I'm saying. We're even talking about that. Yeah, we were even talking about that on the other episode when we when we were talking about. Well, I guess we started touching on cancel culture. And and I was saying I was saying like oh it reminds me of that that the book you know 1984 yeah. with uh, George Orwell because of the the control of what words you can say and can't say so yeah I agree with you there but do you, but do you see what that what happens I mean you see the same thing yeah. in any sort of autocratic society where there is not something outside of human authority to ground human value power is what determines mm -hmm. what's true which is why you see that in you know in the Soviet times and now I would say in the autocratic Russia that exists. You see that in North Korea, you see that in Iran. And, and so we don't, these ideas that we have in the West are far from, from neutral, which is why not only do we have to have a, a powerful spiritual conversation that can lead to Jesus, but we need to wake up to the reality of ideas. Because again, as I said, I think we there could be a real day where this podcast gets shut down for some words we say. Right, yeah, I, that there's a moral police enforcing even something like this. That I, I think it's a, we need to be less um, on the sidelines about things. I mean, um, mm -hmm. okay, before this is a long time ago, but when I was again, this was in the the 80s, or just no, actually, it was just before the fall of the Soviet Union, 
And uh, there's a thing called Solidarity uh, in Poland. And basically, yeah, Poland broke the back of communism. Um, and there's a, a dock worker in Gdansk, Lech Walesa, and he had this, this thing called Solidarity. And uh, a lot of the scene that I was involved in during that time, they're all about Solidarity, you know, because they were standing up wow. to the repression. And I had friends who were beaten up by the police in Poland and that kind of thing. And so, you know, I, you know, I wore my Solidarity button, you know, on my jacket. Uh, and I would be criticized by people in the church who would say, what are you doing? You shouldn't, you know, this is a violent movement in Poland, you know, and I'm going, are you mm -hmm. serious? I mean, this is a group who's standing up to the oppression of communism who are risking their lives. Uh, so I, you know, and, and, and uh, I gladly wear a solidarity button on my, sh on my jacket, you know, and, and stand with them. And I was doing a lot of things in Poland during that time, but I think, I think um, there are there are times when the church, when if we are followers of Jesus, we need to stand up, you know, against the, what's going on and, and be a, we need to, to not be so careful, you know, about not wanting anyone to, to be offended. I don't I, this to me is not the same thing as as being what we say we're against. You know, we're the be, be in our own uh, form of the morality police in f telling people mm -hmm. how they have to live. You know what I mean? In that sense. Mm -hmm. But I think so. I, know, I don't mean that, but I mean, we need to stand up for true causes that we so can identify with that Jesus, Jesus himself would stand up against. And I yeah. think mm -hmm. that's what needs to happen more. Well, and I think that's mm -hmm. what you're seeing, even in that King Ram it's kind of his his uh, moniker online this iranian guy who was interviewed by michaela peterson was saying that yeah that the people in iran feel like if we don't stand up now it's going to be too late like mm -hmm. as bad and it's unimaginably bad now i mean we don't understand the kind of courage it would take to stand up to that kind of government and yet what he's saying is that the people there feel like this is a window like if they don't stand up now they may never get a chance to overcome this oppression, you know, he started to quote the Martin Niemöller uh, quote um, about, you know, just a little bit after World War II when it came to, to the Nazis, uh, you know, and he, and he said, first they came for the communists and I did not speak out because I was not a communist. Then they came for the socialists and I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionists and I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews and I didn't speak out because I was not a Jew. And then they came for me because there was no one left to speak out for me. Um, mm -hmm. and, and it just talks about the, the, to David's point that we, we have to recognize that we live in, in dangerous times when it comes to ideas. And it's not to mean we should be afraid. There's hope in the, in the name of Jesus. Um, but what the Iranian people are saying is, man, we got to do it now. And in the same sense, I think there needs to be an urgency to speak the truth in our own context, because I, I don't think it's. In a weird paradox, I don't think that it's unimaginable that we are heading to an autocratic reality in the West, just in a different way, through the lens of a, of a certain ideology that's going to be defended in that same way. And you know, I'm not that kind of guy. I'm not mm -hmm. like a conspiracy theory, conspiracy theory kind of guy. Um, but truth is important, and I think we need to speak out for it while we can, like David said. Yeah, and I think another interesting point to what you're saying david is the value of speaking out and sometimes we can be uh cynical about it like oh it's just you know awareness what what are we supposed to do in the west i'll raise awareness and it sounds weak it, it is very comfortable in comparison to what the guys in iran are having to do but something that was really interesting and challenging to me in both the examples we've mentioned here young blood on the stage saying you got to speak up because they're, they're getting their internet cut off and we have to speak out for them. I was like, yeah, that that's true. And then the Ir Iranian guy, I can't remember his name again, you just mentioned King it. King Ram. King Ram, thanks. Um, he he also says something interesting about that. He he was saying um, how how powerful it is to speak up. He, he was saying something like, you, you know, even autocratic governments have Twitter Instagram. accounts and Instagram yeah. and they're, and yeah, they're watching and point. they care about what people are saying. And I was like, wow, I'd never really thought about that because i've often dismissed it as like ah, oh, you know what's hashtag, it gonna do hashtag yeah what's activism. a hashtag gonna do and and actually they're pointing out that it does and that's a you know that's a uh point for 
you know, this this generation, this, you know, social media online generation now that, that we often criticize to be like, ah, oh, it's just online activists. But but actually there's there's a value there. Um, of of understanding and you and strategically using um, the internet and and the global connection that we have to ha- to make a voice heard and and so I guess what it made me think is wow there is real power to um, to influencing uh, world view and culture by sharing and and talking about things and that's another reason why it's important for us to talk about this stuff yeah and as we yeah, kind of seem go ahead Chad go. No, there's also the, a really interesting connection that I, I felt I came across yesterday, which is what's been happening in the country of Iran uh, for the last decade or so in terms of conversion to Christianity by people who are are so fed up with what they're experiencing from the morality police, from the different kind of like po- political side of, of forced religion and um, and I can think to me my my hope and my prayer is that this all of this opens up even more of a door and, and that line of communication for the heart of Jesus to meet people who are oppressed uh, in, in that place and, uh, and, and that of course would be set free and did yeah. we lose Luke <laughs> Luke's he in looks the... he looks a little frozen but we will carry on no <laughs> yeah, you're yeah. you're complete you're completely right and and I think in general, with, a, with again, without making this into sort of a callous talking point, um, this is yet another opportunity for a spiritual conversation with the non-religious in that we can affirm their moral outrage at the murder of, of Masa Amini yep. while gently pointing out that they have a worldview that doesn't support it and help them recognize that there is beauty in Jesus, the one who came for the marginalized, the one who gave his life, the one who affirms our value apart from human opinion, and and that that is only possible in Jesus. And I've had many spiritual conversations where people's moral outrage leads to the gospel because there is no justice outside of Jesus, and that that is simply the truth. Otherwise, it's just a social construct, something we tell ourselves— with no way to fix it. And so kind of like the way we've been ending every every week here, we want you to, to not only know how to, to think about these issues, but how to see them as opportunities uh, to reach your friends, your neighbors, your colleagues, those you work with and live by. And and when you experience this outrage, and, and they should be outraged, we should be outraged. We need to be equipped. We need to be experts at recognizing that and saying, let's talk about where that comes from. Because as Tom Holland, the secular historian, points out, there is no human value and dignity apart from the Judeo-Christian ethic. I mean, this is a guy who has no vested interest in saying that other than just looking at the facts. Uh, and so we can see that as an opportunity uh, and we can we can have a spiritual conversation. So, yeah, it's a, it's a hard topic. Um, but again, I think it's just proving week after week that our, our world, albeit messy and broken um i think jesus wants to break through in all of those contexts and situations and um yeah bring his love and truth and 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 hope uh, and he wants to use us to do that so that's my encouragement to you um keep praying for the people of iran don't forget even though they're cutting off the internet and trying to move on um pray what god might have you do the bible is filled with calls to fight injustice right that is something that is not an option. God's heart breaks for those that are, are treated poorly, that are mistreated, and, and that's what clearly was embodied in the life of Jesus. Um, pray for our work in, Le- in Lebanon and Beirut. Um, you know, we're, we're, yeah. I'm sure we'll reach a lot of Iranians in Beirut, and we'll probably send a lot of people from Beirut to Iran one day. That would be the hope and prayer. Well, well that was something I was going to say, Ben, as well. Is like I think this uh, a big opportunity here f- is for us to— Remember that part of the world and realize that there's a whole um, reality there of people who are not how you imagine the Middle East, who need to hear the gospel. And they need to hear it in a way that makes sense to them. They're, 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 many of those guys and girls protesting will have similar questions about who Jesus is to, to people in more secular culture in other countries. And so we need a new missionary movement to go 
all over the world, including the Middle East. And a lot of mission, there's a lot of great missionary work going on in the Middle East, but a lot of it just reaches those guys' parents and people in rural areas. There, there is not significant missionary movement going on in urban places in, and with these people, like university students and, and all of that in the Middle East, and we need more. So that's been something we've prayed about for a while in our mission. I wanted to make the most of this to just to to speak that out again and say, maybe God is calling you to the Middle East and maybe, you know, you need to join our mission. We need more people. Yeah. We need to reach that part of the world. So, Hey, look, before I forget, did you save your file? Like, if, did your computer die? No, I managed to plug it in before it died. Okay, good. Okay, good. Yeah, um, sorry about that. Real quick, what do you think we should do? Should we save the story, the punching through the word for next week? It's gotten That's pretty fine. long, but not in a bad, yeah. not in a bad way. I think maybe so. we should. That's my gut. How about we pause and I just address the elephant in the room and then we just end, all right? Okay. Yeah, you're absolutely right, Luke. Um, well, a quick uh, little admission on my part. Uh, I said in the set list we had punching through the awkward with Chad. <laughs> and, and Chad gave a great setup. I said it was it expensive. We were expecting and something was amazing. He even gave a, gave a great teaser and, and I totally yeah. forgot. So, fault for me. Uh, but now you're on the edge of your seat. You cannot wait. The suspense is killing you, and it will come next week. I promise. <laughs> Punching through the awkward with Chad, even if we have to just completely abandon David's random story for the next month, I'll do it. Wow. I will do that if <laughs> I have to. Whatever it takes. Yeah, I don't well, know what David to say. Did say I, we have to I, that's <laughs> willing. That's not really encouraging for me, but if that's what it takes, Wait, you we said have we have it. to be willing to sacrifice. Yeah, that's yeah. Where yeah. things change. Yeah, I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll do it for Chad. Thanks, David. All Thank right. You. Well, that's it. Leave us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. Something pleasant, something with five stars. Thank something you for listening. Go to the Steiger oh, Intensive. Go grab a burrito, and we'll talk to you next week. Peace. <laughs>